the uh, next item is approval of the agenda for tonight. My okay, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Pinwell. Um, staff would like to request that we switch items 11 and 12 on the agenda. Okay. Are there any other additions or deletions? If not, I will request a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I make the motion. Second. You can second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And the agenda is approved. Uh, further uh, review of the minutes of the last meeting. I trust all the board members have had a chance to review. And if so, are there any deletions or deletions or corrections? Excuse me, Mr. Penwell, can you move your mic closer? Thank you. I can only be heard a long ways away, I'm sorry. <laughs> so another additions or deletions or corrections of the minutes? I, if so, I'll uh, move that they be approved. I make that motion. Second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the minutes are approved. And now before we proceed on, I'd like to um, remind the, the board and our attendees, planning board members, let's remember that conversations and remarks on this deal are, are meant to be a matter of public record. That being the case, I will ask that we restrict conversations, sidebars with our, with our friends and neighbors next door, make everything public, public and everybody will be heard. Uh, secondly, we'd like to sure welcome all the attendees, and again, we'd like to remind you uh, as well as we do that vocal remarks or outbursts uh, are, al are also improper and, and restricted. So please, if you have something to say to your neighbor, keep it at a level that cannot be heard. Whispering only, please. Uh, if, we have, um, if we have too much commotion going on, then we have to take an action. If that slows down, that's not why we're here. So. With that in mind, thank you, and... Excuse me, uh, Chairman Powell. Item five, introduce guests and speakers. We do not have any for the evening. Five. Item number five, we do not have any special oh, guests yes. or speakers. Uh, yes, yes, correct, thank you. And public comment, we have several signed up. Uh, the first I have, and a reminder again, the comments are Unfortunately, restricted to three minutes. Uh, that's the rule that we always have followed. Yes, please. You are Irma Forger? Good evening. If you will state your name and address for public record. Uh, and then you my name, I'm going to take the mask off. <laughs> yeah, please do. My name is Irma Forger. I reside at 1056 Tideline Drive in Leland. And I want to thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, there are seven of us here tonight, um, homeowners. Uh, we represent Shoreline at Westgate, which is a community of 56 one-story townhome units, uh, duplexes and quads. And we're right next door to Leland's Westgate Nature Park. On the other side of us is a development going up uh, under, it's underway, and it's presently known as Westgate 26 Acres. Our homes at Shoreline at Westgate are on two streets, that's the whole neighborhood, uh, Shellbank Lane and Tideline Drive. These streets are private roads, and that means only that although we pay the same taxes to the town and to the county, we have to maintain our own roads. And that's an expensive item in our budget, as you can imagine. Um, the current plan for the building at Westgate 26 shows a connection of the road from the development in the back known as, I think, Parcel 8B, um, with our road tideline drive, the road I live on. And that 
is upsetting to all of us, that, especially those that live on Tideline Drive, but the whole community of 56 homeowners. To think of there would be 100 homes, two-story homes behind us connecting to our road. Uh, there are about four or five other exit roads in that community, but we would be, Tideline Drive would be a straight <coughs> shot from them out to Westgate and out to 17. I'd take that road if I lived there. It's the most direct route. Mm. Uh, and to think that there were 100 units back there, if even half of those people drove, decided to drive through our street, that would about double the number of traffic, of traffic going on that street where there were 24 homes on that street tideline. That would double it. Can I just, I'll just jump down to, um, Please go ahead. I would, Conclude. I would strongly urge a petition. I would beg the town of Leland to do whatever they can to close off that access road. That <coughs> that property back there is not landlocked. They have four or five other residents. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, your remarks for each of the speakers, by the way, whether whether we, we don't have time to discuss them, obviously, but they're made a matter of record. They are recorded and they, they will be noted, okay? So thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna take just one minute quickly because I assume there's a lot of people here who may not have been to a planning board meeting. Uh, but this, this is the same format for every meeting. The guest speakers have to be there. The members up here are the planning, are the planning board. We're minus one member tonight. My name is Bob Penwell, I'm the, I'm the chairman. Uh, over to your right, over here, is what we call the staff. Uh, it's consisted of the, uh, the senior planners. Uh, Sabrina Reithart is the town clerk. She uh, keeps, keeps everything in order as well. And, and that's the procedure. So we try to, uh, there's only one speaker at a time. And so that's the reason we return to the address. Okay, very good, thank you. I have now a Lawrence Phipps. Phipps? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. My name is Lawrence Phipps, and I reside at 1053 Tide Line Drive, Leland, North Carolina, 28451. I'd also like to thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, I'll give you a little history. Uh, I'm speaking also about the easement that Ms. Folder talked about. In 2007, the planning board approved the development of Shoreline at Westgate. That's where we live. It was uh, at that time two parcels of land, parcel 8A and parcels 8B, and parcel 8B is a landlocked piece of property owned by SD West LLC at the time. Parcel 8A was developed with 56 housing units made up of both quadplexes and duplexes, and, part, uh, and parcel 8B was never developed. It remains undeveloped at this time. In 2008, the SD West LLC placed two easements on parcel 8A, an easement to allow utilities to pass through parcel 8A, our parcel, and then a second easement, which is a road connection easement to allow, out of necessity, the uh, access to uh, parcel 8B. Uh, that would give them then access to Westgate Drive. Uh, that easement also required parcel 8A owners to be responsible for all parcel 8A road maintenance. Shoreline has two <laughs> private roads, neither of which are maintained by the city of Leland, by Brunswick County, or by the state of North Carolina. Mm. In 2014, SD West LLC turned over parcel 8A, again our parcel, ownership to the Shoreline at Westgate Owners Association. The 8A easements also became the responsibility of the owner's association. Last year, parcel 8B was sold to Dominion Land Corporation and they have combined parcel 8B with two other parcels to form a tract uh, of land identified as Westgate 26 acre. The entire tract will have their own access to Westgate Drive. 
that also will be a private road. The shoreline at Westgate is asking the planning board to allow for the removal of parcel 8A road access easement. If the easement is not removed and with the anticipated increase in traffic from the 256 homes, not 100 homes, uh, the shoreline at Westgate Community will be stressed to maintain our private roads. Uh, and, and I doubt that we will be able to properly maintain them as they are today. If the easement cannot be removed, we ask that at a minimum, the connecting access area be designated as a emergency use only. Having this restriction would allow emergency vehicles to access the new development, but restrict the use of shoreline at Westgate's private roads. Thank you all for letting me talk to you this evening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Hearing Thank none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I have a Roger Shoe. Uh, good evening. My name is Roger Shue. I live at 4910 in Wilmington, but I also have home and land in Brunswick County up on Mako Road, where I grew up. I've submitted numerous maps and images to you on this topic, which is the initial uh, look at the area of the point over on the river. And one of the things I will not repeat tonight is all those details for your benefit. But the area is less than five feet in elevation. The area is surrounded by primary nursery grounds. The water table is at the surface and stormwater management would be problematic at best in that area. But the real issue is the mm -hmm. water. In multiple days since the start of the year, Point Peter has experienced flooding to some degree. In fact, back in the first week of January, there were seven days in a row with some level of flooding on Harbor Road, the one connector to the point. This was not a rain event, but just high tide flooding. During one of those days, the water level was 2.4 feet above mean highest high water. The water level is what the normal water level will be every day at mid-century, by the way. And if you add two to four feet of rise with storms, river flooding, or high tide flooding, which we've experienced six times in the last five years, then you're gonna have issues of possible six feet of water on that property. <laughs> at mid-century, we'll have hundreds of days of high tide flooding to deal with on that property particularly enhanced by sea level. There is a reason there's regulations and limitations on development in high risk settings such as this. CAMA regulations provide numerous cautionary statements on development here, and Mr. Pasquale's own words before he resigned from the development group were, anyone who says this area is not going to flood is a fool. Of course, you will hear the developer say that engineers can engineer around this. Well, engineers can do remarkable things, but it isn't whether you can do something, it's whether you should do something. No prudent person should put a major structure in an expanding and deepening floodplain. The developers say the riverfront mixed-use district will enhance and preserve environmentally sensitive areas along the river and that it will protect public access and preserve cultural and natural resources. I don't see how putting a 240-foot plus structure on wetlands in a floodplain surrounded by uh, nursery grounds is going to do the river or the land any good. I'd also like to make a comment on their statement that the proposed plan is consistent with Leland's master plan of highly valued and protected natural and cultural resources. They say the project will augment components of Leland's natural environment that will provide recreational opportunities, protect valuable natural resources, and keep people and investments safer from flooding. I will say this would be a structural miracle. You, pr you protect those things by working with nature and not by putting structures on nature. And finally, Leland's own 2020, 2045 comprehensive plan states, we have goals of increasing environmental buffers around sensitive waterways and very importantly, limiting development within the 100 year floodplain. I don't believe is what's planned between Thomas Rose and Isabel Holmes Ridge comes anywhere close to accomplishing any one of those particular goals. One last thing is that the Army Corps is now looking to move off of Eagles Island because of this flooding. That might be a cautionary statement to everybody. Thank you for your time and service, and I'd be happy to address any questions. And thank, thank you, you, Mr. Shoup. Uh, next, I have a Dan George. Is it George or Gorge? I can't quite say. George, there we go. Welcome. 
Hi there, I'm Dan George. I live at 9140 Hickory Lane in Winnebago. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I am representing the board of the Brunswick Environmental Action Team in opposition to the Point Peter Project and the inevitable impact that will present the future of our river and the livelihoods of our shared communities. Forgive me if I'm not prepared. It's funny how fast and short notice these things often seem to be. As an avid fisherman and frequent user of the Cape Fear River and its tributaries, I've always had a deep concern of the unfortunate struggles concerning water quality and development. We have not been good stewards of our environment, and as a result, we now must contend with pollutants, including coal ash, hog and municipal waste, Gen X, and many other PFAS chemicals, insecticides and fertilizers, just to name a few. This high-rise development is a step in the opposite direction of where we should be headed, and it's located in the floodplain where inevitably which will inevitably cause future problems and expenses to the taxpayers. All of the pollutants and problems we are facing in the Cape Fear Basin are as a result of selling out to short-sighted development and industries, and in the end it always falls on the taxpayers to fix it as we're seeing now. Please do not fall for the allure presented by shiny salesmen yet again at the expense of the environment and our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Greg Stanley, please. There we go. Good evening. My name is Greg Stanley. I reside in the Westport community at 1014 Ringlet Court. I only learned of this uh, Peter Point discussion for this board last night via WECT News after learning that New Hanover, Can uh, New Hanover County had rejected the offers, I believe, of the developers. I am not anti-development, but at the same time, what I see in the size, the scope, and the density does not seem appropriate to Wilmington or this community. I think many people are concerned about increased traffic, increased density, and some of the other problems that people have discussed tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. And uh, Sue Ann Rush. Good evening. My name is Sue Ann Rush, and I reside at 1060 Stonebridge Lane in Leland. I'm disappointed that a proposed RUMXD zoning testament amendment has floated its way from New Hanover County onto the Leland Planning and Zoning Board's dais tonight. In my opinion, this proposed text amendment embraces neither the sound input or sincere visions offered to you in good faith by the citizens and taxpayers of Leland in your recently adopted 2045 plan. This proposed amendment would turn Leland's land use planning in the wrong direction. And that wrong direction is filled with financial potholes, improbabilities, uncertainties, and potentially dire consequences for our Leland taxpayers. <coughs> in a paper published by the Association of State Floodplain Managers regarding government liability, they provide us with a subtle warning that the courts have held local elected officials liable if they increase the hazards in floodplains. Building structures like what is under consideration at Point Peter will clearly increase flood hazards. <coughs> I strongly urge you to reject this proposed amendment this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is uh, Braden Willis. My name is Brayton Willis. I live at 1177 Willow Pond Lane here in Leland. And for full disclosure, my lovely bride of 30 years sits on the planning board. And as a result of the, the uh, agenda being passed on Friday, I've been making my own meals and eating them 
with my dog alone. Uh, also, uh, I sit on Leland's Economic Development Committee. I am the chairman of the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee for Brunswick County NAACP and the secretary on a similar committee at the state NAACP. A note about the NAACP, the NAACP serves people of color, all people of color, regardless of what color they are. The NAACP was opposed to this text amendment when it originally appeared in the New Hanover County uh, planning uh, meeting last November, and we continue to oppose it in any form. For the record, I have provided you with copies of both of the letters that we sent, not only to New Hanover County, but <coughs> also to your planning director here. So letters of opposition. Before I go any further, I also want to say that we need to be very grateful to the elected officials here in Leland for their forethought and action to establish and ordained uh, Chapter 26 of Leland's Floodplain Ordinance. This ordinance established as a critical gateway for the legal requirements concerning any and all development contemplated within the town's jurisdictional floodplain. Our elected leaders clearly recognized and have ordained that the flood prone areas within the jurisdiction of the town are subject to periodic inundation, which results in a loss of life, property, health, <coughs> and safety hazards, disruptions of commerce and governmental services, extraordinary public expenditures of flood protection and relief, and impairment of the tax base, all of which adversely affects the public health safety and general welfare. Furthermore, they realize that these flood losses are caused by the cumulative effect of obstructions in the floodplains, causing increased flood heights and velocities, and by occupancy in flood prone areas of uses vulnerable to floods or other hazards. Members of the planning board, this ordinance is the gateway, the legal prescription, a test, if you will, that this text amendment must pass through first. Regarding any proposed development in leading Leland floodplains, this simple ordinance prescribes the most eloquent uh, belief that there will be no adverse impact to the taxpayers and no physical ecological functions to our floodplain period. It is our position that this proposed amendment fails that gateway test completely. Thank you for the privilege of your time and attention. And thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. Glenn Leviton? Yes. Close enough, huh? Rise of Floristan. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Joanne Levitian. I live at 2106 Talmadge Drive in Leland. Uh, I also want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, and I echo many of the words that those who knew way, way more than me, such as Brayton Willis, have already, have already told you about why this is not a great idea. Um, I'm urging you to deny the request for the text amendment, and I think you ought to ask yourselves, why did these developers approach the town of Leland? And why did the New Hanover County Planning Board deny the request? And why did the New Hanover County Commissioners defer a decision on this and instead decide to have a working group session in March? And at the very least, before a decision is made, I urge the town to participate in that working group session, which will be a fact-finding mission rather than an automatic approval. I think uh, we're all aware of what's going on with global warming and sea level rise and that 90% of global warming goes into the ocean and that causes sea level rise, which is now rising at one inch every two years. Uh, the entire area of this project is in a current FEMA flood zone. That doesn't sound like a great place to be doing development. Um, even if the buildings are elevated, the access roads are going to flood, so how are people going to get in and out of the development? Uh, I think we've all experienced the sunny day floating, uh, flooding at the battleship, where you get the weather report and it says, oh, you better not go by the battleship because there's going to be flooding there. That's only going to get worse. So because of all these reasons and what's already been said, I certainly agree that uh, you should deny this request uh, for the text <coughs> amendment. And thank you again for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is uh, Robert Parr. 
My name is Dr. Robert Parr. I'm a former oceanographer and a former emergency physician at New Hanover Memorial Hospital. I live at 6706 Falcon Point Road, and that's in uh, New Hanover County. Passage of the Riverfront Urban Mixed Use Amendment will incentivize risky development in an isolated location of the Cape Fear River floodplain. The Cape Fear River floodplain is a dynamic compound floodplain threatened by river flooding, storm surge flooding, high tide flooding, and rapidly accelerating sea level rise. The specific site for the river uh, front urban mixed use amendment has flooded in the past, has flooded multiple times as recently as one month ago, and the frequency and extent of flooding will increase in the future. Questions to ask. When the New Hanover County Planning Board voted five to one to reject a similar amendment to the main, the main reason was the 300 foot height limit was excessive and not good planning. The applicant reduce, reduced that in New Hanover County and is it still in their proposal to 240 feet. Question is, why is it 300 feet now? What is the public benefit of the th going from 240 to 300 feet? What is the expected lifespan of the intense urban development in the floodplain, a floodplain that presently floods and has a limited time horizon? The time horizon for major flooding in that location is approximately 30 to 40 years. So are the buildings that they're putting up, do they have the same time horizon? Or who's going to remove those buildings? Will it come on the city of Leland to uh, remove those buildings when it no longer becomes habitable? Uh, who pays for the failing infrastructure that will start to fail within 30 to 40 years? Will that be the town of Leland? Uh, who pays for and provides emergency services? As an emergency physician, when I look at the plans for the access road of this development, it gives me chills. Those <coughs> plans in the TIA were submitted and they did not take into account the present flooding or the future flooding. Uh, and the plan overrides the flood plan amendments and proposals in both New Hanover County and in your uh, county ordinances. Uh, similar to what uh, <coughs> Roger Hsu and Braden said, uh, look at those plans that have been laid out. There, there's uh, very good plans and this plan overrides all those. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you and thank you Dr. Park. Uh, the last speaker I have is uh, David Johnson. Good evening. Hello, my name is David Johnson. I live at 1202 South Sleepy Oak Lane in Leland, North Carolina. And I recently heard about the development on Eagle Island. And I just wanted to echo some of the thoughts here of my fellow residents of Leland. I am concerned uh, about sea level rises and I've seen the flooding that's already taken place in that area. I know these obstacles can be remediated. Look at the Netherlands. It is possible. Are those in the plan? I just ask the board to take this under careful consideration. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Nicely summarized. Uh, our thanks to, to all of the speakers and we appreciate the fact <coughs> respect within the time requirements. Three minutes is, is, is hard. Uh, you, you have to be very quick and get to the bottom line. We appreciate that very much. Moving on then to uh, item number seven, the uh, and I believe the town clerk has the floor for this. Ms. Reinhardt. Thank you, Chairman Penwell. The town council amended the board and committee rules of procedure at the February 17th regular council meeting. And the rules were amended to abide by Senate Bill 473. The bill prohibits public officials from participating in making and administering a contract by the following actions. Knowingly participate in contracts that benefit nonprofits of which that public official is associated. Attempting to influence any other person who is deliberating or voting on the contract or soliciting or receiving something in exchange for recommending or influencing the award of the contract. 
staff has added a conflict of interest association disclosure to the agenda items that are not time initiated. You'll note those in your packet this evening. The chairman will ask if any board member has a conflict of interest or association disclosure announcement prior to discussing the agenda item. Since the boards and committees vote on recommendations, most likely the need to recuse a board member would be rare. If a board member needed to be recused, the board would follow Rule 19, duty to vote. A few other amendments were made to the rules of procedure because they did not apply to the boards and the committees. For example, state statutes prohibit boards and committees from holding closed session meetings. Were there any other uh, questions that you had this evening regarding those changes that were made or about the procedure? Just for clarity then, the question to be asked is any of the board members have a conflict of interest or associations for each separate action item? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Okay, anybody else? All right, thank you. Are there any questions from the other board members? Nope. Okay, very good, and thank, thank you. <coughs> I, I then it is um, number eight. Uh, and, okay, there we go, go ahead. Excuse me. So, for example, this is the first item, yep. and you would ask the board if they have a conflict of interest or association disclosure. Very good. Very good. Are there any conflict of interest associations or other other things that would disclose you? If not, the, uh, the answer is no. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Ben Watts. Item eight point two is a preliminary subdivision plat. The Pinewood Cannon 2 subdivision parcel on the screen. Applicant is Hanover Design Services. This parcel total is approximately 170 acres. It's located just south of Grayson Park, north of Town Creek Road, and directly adjacent to the Pinewood Cannon 1 subdivision that you all reviewed earlier. It's currently zoned R6, which is our medium density residential district. The subdivision would result in 459 single-family residential lots. The application was reviewed, went through TRC, and all comments have been addressed as a temporary night. Here's a vicinity map. Directly above the site is Grayson Park. To the south, Town Creek Road. And again, to the right of the site is Pinewood Cannon 1, the first subdivision of this area. As I previously stated, the development would create 459 lots. They all meet the spatial requirements of R6 performance standards. The roads are intended to be public with five foot sidewalks on both sides. Mulholland Drive, a collector street, has an eight foot multi-use path along one side. This development also contains 77.33 acres of open space, which exceeds the town's minimum active and passive open space requirements. Here is a site map. I've circled around the uh, current and proposed future connections. There are 12 of them. All of the required street connections are not shown. There is a requirement for one additional connection on the northern boundary, which I will show you in a moment. Now the planning board may reduce the number of required vehicular connections based on environmental constraints <coughs> that are indicated on the collector street suitability map. The suitability map does not provide data for this area, but based on the water feature, Beaver Dam Swamp, flood zones and wetlands in the area, the collector street would categorize this area as least suitable to somewhat suitable for future roadway connections. The applicant is requesting that the street connection requirements be reduced from two to one due to the presence of environmental constraints. The northern boundary is circled here on your screen. Zoomed in a little bit. You can see that it's not a typical boundary. It's quite jagged, and that's because it follows the Beaver Dam uh, Swamp Creek, which feeds into Town Creek. The gray hatched marks uh, that kind of line the border here are all wetlands, identified wetlands. You can see to the top of the screen, that 
the very northern tip of this boundary, Mahone Drive, that's the residential cluster street with the eight foot north east path that runs through both Pinewood Canyon 1 and uh, the second subdivision. The hatch marks I was talking about, wetlands right here. Here's a flood zone map. The dark blue is the AE floodway. That's the 100 year flood zone where base flood elevations have been calculated. And the light blue is the A zone, which is a uh, estimate uh, estimation of the 100 year flood zone where base elevations have not been identified. Staff recommends that Planning Board approve the preliminary plat for Pinewood Canyon 2 as presented. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to try to answer them for you. Questions, comments from the board? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, yes, sir. Can you walk me through the benefit to the town of Leland and the citizens by reducing the number of uh, ingress and egress streets? Yeah, um, so as I said, the northern boundary requires two. One is present, we're asking for leniency on that second connection. Having that connection go through this uh, creek and flood zones and wetlands, uh, number one would, uh, of course, impact the wetlands, impact that stream, which feeds into Town Creek. Uh, that street then being in the flood zone would, uh, of course, be at risk for flooding during flood events. So the benefit would, uh, be not to have those dangers present on the roadway. Um, the parcels to the north would still be accessed uh, in the future by Mulholland Drive, that collector street. And there's also other opportunities to get to different roads uh, more north of this property should those uh, parcels be subdivided in the future. If I may, let me, let me maybe try and rephrase the question. What is the benefit to us as a town by letting or, or approving a request to reduce the burden on the developer. What's the benefit to the town? Hmm. Well, um, I think that's rather specific to the situation, whichever situation you're speaking of. In, in this case, the benefit would be to reduce the risk of, number one, impacting the wetlands and the risk associated with flooded roadways. What I, what I don't see, and no disrespect to anybody here, what I see is uh, a request to reduce the burden on the developer at the detriment to the citizens in that community. That, that's really what I'm getting at. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Matt, this, uh, and I'm sure you've been on this, this whole particular area has been a transportation and the in ingress egress has been a concern of this board with all of the additional annexations out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, for my part, I think it still is. So uh, I would ask uh, in a different manner for Mr. Neaver, uh, if that particular connector point is not desirable or feasible because of the water floodplain, are there any other possibilities that could be enforced now? Just so we know that in fact the developer will follow through as opposed to we will try to do something a year or two down the road. Because that, we're, our fear is that that wouldn't happen. Sorry, could, uh, could my, you repeat that? My question that is, have, has anybody looked at or has developed proposed any other points that might add at least another ingress or egress to the <coughs> city? So yeah, I'll just go back to my map with the circles. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, on the screen before you here is the uh, overall uh, site plan for this Pinewood 2 subdivision. I've circled all of the uh, proposed connections. Some of those access um, roads that are, are already subdivided in Pinewood Canyon 1. Um, the other ones, uh, for example, these lining the top here and these lining the bottom here, these five down here, those are all proposed future connections. So these are all the areas where they have stubbed out per the one future connection per 1,000 feet of, uh, of, of project boundary. Per our ordinance, the only thing they are asking um, is a reduction on this northern boundary just due to the presence of those environmental constraints. So they are already uh, proposing to build 12 total connections for this 170 acre site. But 
But those are just proposed for future. And I mean, how many connections are, are there going to be for those 459 new lots? So currently, yeah, currently with what's approved, we'll have one, two, and three connections to what will be existing streets when they're constructed uh, from the previously approved Pinewood Canyon 1 subdivision. So it does meet the ordinance requirement of connecting to at least two publicly maintained streets. Uh, these future connections are all about county property, so I can't really speak to if and when those you know, future connections will be constructed. That's why we require them to stub out you know, just in case people in the future do uh, develop those properties, they can connect to these stub outs. I guess you know, the question you say once the developer builds back here, you permit the, the developer to build out as far as he can build out to the wetlands, and then we ask for another street, and so that's going to cause the development problem because, you know, that, that road is going to flood. But you permit, the, and we permit the developer to build all the way back to the wetlands. You're talking about uh, Mulholland Drive right, right here? That's right. Yeah, and that was explained to me as there is already an existing uh, path, or what we call it a road. Um, uh, path that crosses Beaver Dam uh, Creek there. So that's why they propose Mahon Drive kind of shift in directions and matching up with what's already existing on the site. There are no other existing crossings over Beaver Dam Creek, or Beaver Dam Swamp rather. Um, but, but as far as flooding, the same problem we'll have with all these homes back here. Mm -hmm. If we have the, the big rain that we're talking about. For these ones? Right, all these homes on this back street back here and all the wetlands back there, we're saying that the only thing going to flood if, is this street here. Developers say, I don't want to go that far because, you know, it's going to flood out. Well, how about these homes? Well, the, these homes are positioned outside of the floodway and outside of wetlands. So the developer's done a, a good job at keeping the homes away from these environmentally sensitive areas. They are now asking to, you know, keep the uh, roadway connection also out of those environmentally sensitive areas. And my last question, mm -hmm. there's an area called Stony Creek. It flooded. And maybe I'm just thinking the developer say, hey, we're Can doing a good... Yeah, Mr. Excuse Excuse me. Me. Thank you. There was an area called Stony Creek down there off of 17. Maybe the developer said the same thing years ago that, you know, that water's not going to get there, but a lot of people lost their homes. Mm -hmm. Back at Pound Creeks runs back of there, so I'm just 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 concerned that, and I really have a problem with with connectivity. Yeah. Four hundred and some odd homes, and you got just a couple ways to get in there and out. The issue I'm having is that we're building all these development off of 17. Everybody got to dump out on 17. The state saying we want to keep it a thoroughfare. We don't want to put up more stoplight. That's the problem coming down 17. Because all these homes are dumping right out there at Town Creek Road. Right, and that's why the traffic... The great thing yeah. is we looked at, we talked about coming through Grayson Park and be able to dump out on 87, then that traffic, could, if they had to, could go on up 087 up to 7476. Exactly. That was another way. So it looked like we were still locking ourselves in as far as all that traffic coming to 17. It I understand. I, and to be clear to me on my point to follow what they're saying is that, uh, and I understand what you're saying, the developer says uh, he will provide all these other connector points in the future. but. I have yet to see anything that says what the future is. One year, five? Well, the because if, if they're going to wait for 450 houses to be built back there, that's that's not good. So uh, I mean, if, if you have a schedule for that, can can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so all of these circled 
connections, um, some of them, uh, these three for example, will connect to previously approved subdivision roads. All of these ones are going to be constructed and stub out to the uh, adjacent properties. I can't say when these stub outs, for example, this one, when this and will and be that, that's connected. That's my question. Because it's, it's it, has the developer given you a schedule for when other properties will yeah, be no, built out. Okay, no, he can't. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah I, I just can't really concern, speak to that. Same concern. Mr. Chairman, a couple comments, if I may. Please. What you have before you is a subdivision that meets all the ordinance requirements with the exception of the second connection, as Mr. Watts pointed out to you. I don't know that requiring that second connection is going to appease the board's concern of a, a connection to an addition to a existing road. I would opine that some of those connections shown in the circles are more likely to become a reality before the connection that they're asking for a waiver for. All right, thank you, Mr. Andrea. Are there any other comments or questions? If not, I will call for, if anybody chooses to make an amendment. The staff has recommended the planning board approve the preliminary plot for parcel number 0560005102. No motion? I deem that to be a, a allowable period of time and the motion is, is denied Very well, for lack you. of a motion. The action is denied for lack of a motion. Okay, thank you. Oops, I got the wrong, sorry, there we go. Action number nine is the zoning recommendation for the next one. Uh, does any member of the board have a conflict of interest by association or other bias of interest? No? Welcome back. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Tonight I'll be presenting to you an initial zoning recommendation for parcel 047-000-1001. This is to coincide with a proposed annexation that's been submitted to the town. The application for annexation has been submitted by the property owner, Mr. Carl Martin. It's been a voluntary annexation that's located off of Lambeau Road near Hearthstone Subdivision and approximately a little less than one acre. The plan board shall review any proposed zoning map amendments as stated in our ordinance and make a recommendation uh, zoning recommendation to town council. In January 18th, 2022, a voluntary annexation was received from the petitioner and the town council adopted a resolution directing the town clerk to investigate the petition last week at the town council meeting. <coughs> On your screen is a vicinity map of the subject parcel outlined in red as you can see, the proximity to Hearthstone to its north or west, I should say. All the areas outlined in blue and in shaded blue are part of the town's jurisdiction. All the other items that are in white are currently in the unincorporated area of Brunswick County. On the screen is the aerial uh, photography it shows the, the development as currently in that area. Again, the subject parcel is outlined in red. The location of the nearest flood zones are off to the off to the east. And then we have the current zoning currently in the county is R6000. As everything in purple, everything in shaded blue is going to be the town's jurisdiction. Town staff are proposing a R6 medium density zoning that's uh, consistent with the area and development in the area for the town. A comparison of the current zoning as well as the proposed zoning is on your screen. Everything is quite similar between the county as well as the town with a very uh, little difference in the setbacks. Mm -hmm. 
And then our future land use map, that's in our uh, comprehensive 2045 plan, does designate this area as natural resources or oriented development or a moderate development potential. This does allow for a more traditional neighborhood build type build with a medium density, which is consistent with our R6 zoning district. In, um, in relationship to a consistency to our master land use plan, uh, it, the proposed zoning is livable, for, it supports a livable, diverse, and connected neighborhood that accommodates growth. In particular, promotes growth where there's already an existing and plan funded roadway and utility infrastructure for the town. In addition, it also incrementally expands the town boundaries based upon the existing infrastructure, adjacency to existing development, economic opportunity, and the availability of community services and need. That said, staff does offer recommendation for planning board to an, um, re recommend an R6 medium density um, zoning as it's consistent with the Leland 2045 mm -hmm. uh, strategic, I'm sorry, strategy of locating and economy growth as reasonable in the public interest because of the proposed zoning is consistent with the adjacent zoning and development. With that, I will take any questions. Ms. Gable, please. Uh, Andrew, since action item 10 is the 9.66 uh, acres surrounding and, and behind this parcel, safe to assume that this will uh, be a development at some point? Actually, no, it's not. It's actually two separate applications. Um, on the state of annexation submissions for this particular one, it stays for a, a single, single family home. Okay. Um, the next one following will be for a, it looks like it appear to be a major subdivision of 35 subdivisions, but there's no plan of that's been presented to staff that is going to be the same it just happens to be at the same point got it thank you sir sure any other question no comment it's all under 10 in motion I'll make a motion and if you will please this one has to be read <laughs> you can do this <laughs> this request is consistent with the objectives and policies of the following plan. Am I reading order? No, you're not. <laughs> right, that's yeah. the one on my page. Yeah. I, did, I had the wrong one. I think you're on the Okay. Motion to recommend the council approve the initial zoning and annexation area as our six medium density residential district as the board finds that the initial zoning request is one consistent with the Leland 2040 strategy of locating or accommodating growth within the log logical locations in the planning area to enhance and return on investment and feasibility and two reasonable in the public interest because the proposed zoning is consistent with the adjacent zoning and development okay i played with that look at look at your screen <laughs> i don't want to this a motion has been made do i have a second please second moved and second Comments or questions? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. <coughs> Thank you. And we move on to action item number 10. The another voluntary annexation is essentially the follow-on. Does anybody have any conflict of interest or association uh, biases? Nope. nope. If not, Andrew, continue please. As it was alluded to before, this is going to be a very similar um, presentation due to the proximity. Um, it's just, just two separate applications, so may run through this a little bit quicker. So again, this is an initial zoning recommendation for parcel 047-000-1002. The applicant is Hilla Builders, and the, the, prop, the parcel is approximately 9.66 acres, again, located off of Landville Road near Hearthstone. You are providing a recommendation for the initial zoning uh, as in regards to a, an annexation petition that's been submitted to the town. Um, the February 1st, the application was provided to staff and February 17th was when town council directed the town clerk to initiate the petition, investigate the petition, pardon me. So again, the proximity of the previous presentation to this one is just, it's, it busts it. So um, again, highlighted red is the subject parcel. Again, so, so highlighted in red with the aerial map of the l current development. 
the location towards the nearest flood zones. The current zoning district, uh, again, everything in purple is the town's incorporated area and zoned R6000. Everything in blue is the town's jurisdiction and which is gonna be an R6 medium density, which is what staff is proposing. Again, the density standards and, um, uh, sorry, development standards and density comparison is on the tape, a screen, very similar. Master data use plan calls out for the same type of, um, I'm sorry, the future land use plan does call for the similar type of build, build, which is for medium density, and being this potentially being a major subdivision has the opportunity to preserve some open space. The consistency to the Leland 2045 master plan is for the same. And moving forward into our recommendations, staff recommends um, that plan board make a recommendation for the R6 for the same reasons as our previous presentation. Comments, questions? If not, the chair will recommend approval and a motion to recommend council approve the initial zoning as R6 medium density residential district as the board finds that the initial zoning is consistent with the Leland 2045 strategy of locating or accommodating growth within, lo within logical locations and planning area to enhance return on investment and feasibility and to reasonable and in the public interest because proposed zoning is consistent with the adjacent zoning and development. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And motion passes. Thank you very much. Now we're uh, going to move to um, uh, action item number 12. And before I start that, once again, this site select master plan update. Any any conflict of interest by association or deed? There are none. Thank you. Go right ahead. Just going to skip through number 11 here. Bear with me. All right. Item 12.2 is a site specific plan and master land use plan update for parcel 058. 0007, which is the Brunswick Forest Master Plan, uh, Master Parcel. The applicant is Funston Land and Timber. Brunswick Forest is an approximately 4,600 acre planned unit development off of Highway 17. Uh, the parcel before you is the Master Parcel that was originally split up and continues to be subdivided. The site specific plan and Master Land Use Plan update is for Phase 9, Section 2. Here's a vicinity map. You have Brunswick Forest's water tower to the north of the site, Sunny Point Railroad running along its eastern edge. This is at the very southern portion of Brunswick Forest PUD. <coughs> For approval, the planning board should consider whether this site-specific plan implements the master land use plan, whether it meets the ordinance, and if it promotes the purpose of a planned unit development. So this implements the master land use plan by uh, providing the lots that parcel D was approved for in the master land use plan. All ordinance requires, uh, uh, excuse me, all ordinance requirements are met with this subdivision. <coughs> and all areas in parcel D are intended for residential uses, therefore promoting the purpose of this planned unit development. As I stated, this area is zoned PUD development consists of 123 single family lots as well as 48 duplex units. The streets are intended to be public, five foot sidewalks on each side, and the continuation of Greenspring Boulevard having an eight foot multi-use path. The development is under an existing state stormwater permit so it will need to be updated after approval. And H2GO Leland will be the water and sewer service provider for this subdivision. Here is a site map. We have Greenspring Boulevard running along the Sunny Point Railroad. All street connections are shown. The staff concludes that ordinance requirements are met and recommends that the planning board approve this site specific plan and master land use plan update. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Question. I have a comment. Yes, please. Um, I was pleased to see that there's a boulevard running along the railroad rather than having the houses backed up to the railroad. Yeah. I, can see I was pleased to see a boulevard 
um, adjacent to the railroad rather than to have the houses backing up to the railroad. So it gives a little more of a buff for there. Absolutely. Good, thank you. Any other comments, questions? If not, I will uh, call for a motion. I so move. A second? Second. The move and second the staff um, conclude the ordinance requirements are met and recommends the planning and met site specific plan and master use update. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. And now we go back to item max item number 11, please. Excuse me, Mr. Pamela, if you could just ask about the disclosure. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, thank uh, you. This one, uh, again, once again, are there any persons of conflict of interest or by association? No, sir. None? Proceed, thank you. Thank you. So item 11.2 is a Brunswick Forest Master Land Use Plan Amendment. The applicant is Hanover Design Services. Uh, Brunswick Forest is a plan unit development located off of Highway 17 and directly abuts Mallory Creek Plantation on its eastern side. Again, this PUD is approximately 4,600 acres. Now, all PUDs, including Brunswick Forest, are developed with a master land use plan and any changes to land use designations within these master land use plans must be approved by planning board and town council. Here's a site map outlining in red the entirety of Brunswick Forest's PUD. We have Highway 17 to the north, to the east is Mallory Creek Plantation, and splitting the PUD down the middle, more or less, is the Sunny Point Railroad. Section 6613D, Planning Board and Town Council shall consider and be guided by these following five criteria when reviewing master land use plans and subsequently amendments. They are compatibility of the project with the surrounding districts and land uses, the effectiveness of the project in providing more economical and efficient uses of the land. The third is the effect on the ability of the town to provide public facilities or services to these areas. Fourth is the effectiveness of the project in providing and preserving open space, scenic quality of the site, and recreational opportunities. And the last is the degree to which the project will provide a more desirable development and living environment than would be possible under conventional district requirements. So here is the current master land use plan. And here, the proposed master land use plan. I will go into uh, further detail about the specific areas that are changing, but wanted to provide you with an overall comparison. So a summary of changes, parcel H and G, which are at the very top of our PUD right here. Parcel H, slight increase from 80.7 to 92.5 acres. Parcel G, a slight increase of 35.6 to 43.6 acres. And you can see their change in shape from what is current on the left to the proposed on the right. In the similar area of our civic space, which they decrease from 70.2 to 64 acres, we have what is current civic space here, proposed civic space running along K Todd, which is where the Loblolly Park, uh, the town of Leland Oak property is. And additionally, in parcel A, running along the edge of against Mallory Creek. The commercial area from 233.5 acres from 178.5, and the area in question changes from what is uh, currently approved what is proposed. Now you may be noticing that uh, the commercial area here is increasing in size visually, but the acreage is decreasing. And that is uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, some areas here may appear larger while their acreages are getting smaller. This is due to past procedural discrepancies, uh, <coughs> the addition of railroad acreage into the total acreage of the site, and the advancement of surveying accuracy over the past 16 years. And 
another change is parcel D, this larger parcel that runs from parcel H and G all the way down to the very tip of the PUD. Slight change in acreage here, increase of about 10.6 acres, mainly changing this northern boundary, making room for the civic space on the right side of parcel D. So the amended master land use plan meets the review criteria as indicated below. These are the five items that I read to you earlier. The first one, compatibility with surrounding districts and land uses. All these parcel boundary changes remain compatible with the districts and uses. The uses aren't changing, it's merely the shapes of the parcel boundaries. Number two, the effectiveness of the proposed project, providing more economical and efficient use of the land. These proposed changes and land use designations are in response to market demand. The third, the effect of the proposed project on the town's ability to provide facilities or services. This modification will not hinder town services from, be from being provided in these areas. The fourth, the effectiveness of the proposed project in providing and preserving open space, scenic quality of site, and recreational opportunities. Any projects in these areas will still need to ensure overall open space requirements are met for the planned unit development. And the fifth item here, the degree to which the project will provide a more desirable development and living environment. All these areas will ma maintain the PUD zoning district and the, and the land uses will remain consistent with surrounding land uses. <coughs> Staff recommends the approval of this master land use plan amendment for the Brunswick Forest PUD. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. <coughs> Comments or questions? This area is continuing to grow, and we've covered most of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with our con concerns, this is a good development, and, and uh, Ms. Lewis' comment was real good. As a matter of fact, I was, I'm happy to see that too. So I'll call for a motion to, uh, to, uh, to approve the master plan use of Brunswick. So moved. A motion and a second. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Watts. Thank you very much. And action item 13, does anyone at this point in time have conflict of interest by association or other disclosure? Mr. Chairman, I have um, full disclosure. My husband did speak earlier on behalf of the NAACP. All right, thank you. Any others? If not, good evening, Mr. Andrea. Good evening. My name is Ben Andre. I'm the Director of Planning and Inspections for the Town of Leland. Thank you all for being patient as we got some, uh, through some other agenda items. The next item on the agenda it is, is a discussion of a proposed text amendment to establish what is being referred to as the Riverfront Urban Mixed Use District. <coughs> I'd like to take a second to talk about the text amendment process in the Town of Leland and how that pertains to what's going on here tonight. We have a series of arrows here on the screen. I'm gonna explain kind of the flow of a text amendment through the town's process here. Usually prior to applications being submitted, we have some conversations with the potential applicant about what they are proposing to change or add to the town's code of ordinances. Call that a pre-application meeting. In some instances, in response to that meeting, the applicant will go back and make some revisions to what they are proposing that's an optional step in the process. Once we receive an application, the staff takes some time to review what is being proposed and review it for consistency with the town's adopted land use plans, as well as how the applicant's proposal fits into the town's code of ordinances. Does it make sense logically how it's organized? Does it create any conflicts within our code of regulations. After the staff performs our review, we schedule it for an item on the planning board's agenda, which is what has happened here tonight. Uh, that scheduling of that item can happen in a couple of different ways. We can schedule it as a discussion only item, which we typically do, staff typically does, in the instance of complex or potentially controversial text amendments. 
Uh, in some instances, staff will schedule the item as simply an uh, item that we ask the planning board to take an action on. Regardless of how staff schedules an agenda item, the planning board does have the option to propose a motion, that motion being either to approve, approve, recommend approval, uh, recommend denial, or continue the item. <coughs> if the planning board chooses to continue the item, it gets scheduled for another planning board meeting. If the planning board continues it to a date certain, uh, that date is made uh, as part of the motion. <coughs> Ultimately, when the planning board has reached a point where they want to make a motion on the item, they are, are tasked with making a recommendation to the town council uh, on whether or not to adopt the uh, proposed tax amendment. The planning, board, uh, planning board's recommendation is not binding to the town council. The town council can choose to uh, take an action that is not consistent with, with what the planning board recommends. Uh, the town council can also choose to take an action that's not consistent with what uh, staff recommends. The town council can also choose to remand the item back to the planning board uh, which is the arrow going back to the planning board there. Um, at the town council public hearing, um, the outcomes, assuming they don't continue the item or remand it back to the planning board, the town council uh, outcomes can be a few different things. They can make a motion to approve the text amendment, and that motion can be to approve it as it's presented to them. They can approve something uh, that's modified, a modified version. They can approve what staff recommends, they can approve what planning board recommends, or it can be a combination of those things. If the town council takes no action or uh, chooses to pass a motion to deny the text amendment, then ultimately the amendment does not become effective. So going into the proposal that's before the planning board tonight for discussion, uh, we received an application for a Code of Ordinances Amendment proposal from Summit Design and Engineering Services. They are proposing to amend Chapter 66 of the town's Code of Ordinances uh, by state statute as well as the town's code. All planning board, uh, all zoning amendments, including text amendments, have to go before the planning board for some consideration. The applicant's proposal would create a new zoning district called the Riverfront Urban Mixed Use District. The proposal would also modify the table of permitted uses in the Code of Ordinances to establish what uses are allowed or not allowed in this new zoning district. And the proposal would create a set of supplemental regulations that would be imposed on development in this zoning district. As is currently drafted, this zoning district would be limited geographically in its area of applicability to in between the Thomas Rhodes Bridge and the Isabel Holmes Bridge. Eagles Island is to the south, which is, uh, hosts the uh, Battleship North Carolina, as well as the uh, causeway coming into Leland. Downtown Wilmington is seen uh, as across the Cape Fear River there and the area, uh, approximate area of applicability is outlined in uh, the center of the screen. Leland's town boundary is shown in the blue, and that is shown extending from the west towards the center of the screen, um, outlined in the blue there. The purple that's in the kind of the bottom left of the screen is the town of Belleville's jurisdiction. I'm gonna go through this proposal in chunks tonight. So I'm gonna start here with uh, the establishment of the zoning district. The, in our code of ordinances, we have a table outlining our existing zoning uh, districts. We have 12 of them. Uh, some of them pertain solely for residential. Uh, we have three commercial districts. We have an office and institutional district. We have a multifamily residential district that accommodates a variety of residential uses and a planned unit development district. We also have a conservation district that was recently modified to uh, broaden its area of applicability in the town. So what we're going to look at here on the screen is 
what is from the proposal. I'm going to read through each of these. You all are welcome to stop me and provide your comments. I'd like to do that as we go, uh, rather than circle back and work through it again. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so this proposal would create a new section, section 66141, and would establish the Riverfront Urban Mixed Use District, saying it is intended to meet 14 primary objectives for development fronting the Cape Fear River on the south end of Eagles Island. Development in this area is intended to be resilient in nature and urban in scale and is envisioned to encourage an efficient mixed use development pattern, enhance and preserve environmentally sensitive areas along the river, protect public access to the river through the creation of quality public spaces, <coughs> preserve cultural and natural resources. Did you wanna go through these one by one or are you just gonna read them all first? If you have some comments, I'll stop right now. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to figure out how this would enhance and preserve environmental sensitive areas along the river. Sure, that's a good question. I think that uh, I would say that later on in the actual supplemental regulations, there are some, uh, some requirements pertaining to resiliency and low impact development that would uh, get to the purpose statement in that bullet. So you want me to wait a little longer to ask some more questions? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so what we're looking at here, are, is, this is the purpose statement. So what this is doing is setting the framework for what the zoning district should do. These bullets that we're seeing here are not obligatory regulatory confinements for development. This is saying what this development should do. The supplemental regulation section later that we'll go through in more detail, it's a lot more wordy. Uh, that is, those are the requirements that would need to be met. So this is saying, here's what the zoning district should do. Okay. The supplemental regulations should be written in a way to meet these intentions. <coughs> I'll continue. Preserve cultural and natural resources, ensure quality design and a variety of built forms that result in a human scale environment that not only enhances the pedestrian realm but offers vistas in both easterly and westerly directions. Promote and enhance transportation mode options, particularly pedestrian and water oriented options. Provide an opportunity for development that is designed with the intent to create a net positive environmental impact in formerly industrial areas. Encourage a mix of uses that foster a sense of community and creates a destination for residents and visitors alike. Create a dynamic and active public realm embedded with resiliency components, with ground floor <coughs> mixed use development that accommodates flood protection, aid in community scale coastal resilience and be designed with risks in mind, adapt resiliency concepts to recover quickly from both small and large storm events, incorporate design techniques to adapt to sea level rise, bolster urban ecosystems, and support brownfield remediation where it's applicable. This is still under the purpose section here. So again, still describing the intent of the zoning district. This paragraph is talking about that this zoning ordinance, this zoning district should allow for an integrated mix of uses on particular individual sites. Uh, that mix of uses being in individual buildings where possible. And also in this paragraph, it does mention specifically the geographic applicability of this zoning district. Finally, under the purpose statement here, it alludes to temporary and accessory uses will be allowed in the, uh, per the existing section of the code that talks about uh, temporary and accessory uses. The next section I'd like to spend some time talking about, or at least hearing some feedback on, is the table of permitted uses. I have not prepared slides to go over the entire table. It's quite lengthy. Uh, in summary, the, ta the uses that are proposed in the zoning district are uh, what would be considered congruent with the compact urban scale of development that is envisioned in this zoning district. Uh, so at this point, we'd like to hear any feedback that you have about the uses that were provided in your agenda package. Mr. Chairman, so 
Um, I guess I have a question, country club and related uses. And public utility water and public utility workshop and storage and group housing. Mm. And, and what is your question? I just questioned why you included them in the table. Okay, it's a fair, fair question. Um, so this is the applicant's proposal. Um, it would be staff's opinion that those uses would be uh, consistent and not incongruent with what the zoning district describes. A country club and permitted uses uh, offers uh, additional recreation opportunities on a, in a mixed use type of site. Items pertaining to utility uses are typically allowed in all zoning districts and important to serve a variety of developments. What, what were also the repair shop? What kind of repair shop? It says repair shop, not elsewhere classified. I'm going to need to defer to the applicants on that one. And so once uh, I conclude with my presentation. Uh, I have a question too, then. Yes, sir. Can. Uh, <coughs> the uh, assisted living facility because in, unless I'm wrong, uh, the facil those assisted living facilitary facilities uh, are then campus and come under the state requirements as, not as, opposed, as opposed to the municipalities and, and therefore has to be and controlled by the state. Am, am I wrong? So that confused me why that would be in there. So th what you said is, is accurate in that there are state regu regulations pertaining to assisted living facilities. They are not exempt from zoning regulations, and so local jurisdictions do have the authority to decide in which zoning districts they can or should uh, occur or should okay. not occur. Okay. So we have an outstanding, some outstanding questions about some uses from Mrs. Willis repair shops in particular. Is there additional feedback on any of the uses? Are there any uses that uh, either don't seem like a good fit that are proposed or potentially uh, should be allowed in this type of zoning district that are not proposed as being permitted? Can you quickly tell us what home occupation is? Home occupation is a, a, a type of use that's typically run out of someone's home. Those are uses that uh, do not create any additional burden on the surrounding community. A typical home occupation may be something like an accountant that does not have a, oh. a separate office but works from home. Okay. Perhaps has an occasional person client. Commercial use in a private home. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other okay. questions on uses? Huh? If not, we can okay. move on. Yeah, we have some outstanding ones that we'll circle back to. Okay. The well, next area for consideration is amendment to the parking requirements under section 66, 260, 276, excuse me. Uh, the applicant is proposing uh, no minimum or maximum for the number of required parking. Mr. Chairman, oh, I think sorry. parking should be addressed with the minimum, at least a minimum. Sure. Amount any, of parking. any suggestions for a minimum required amount? No, I haven't really had the package long enough to think about it, but I mean, it really does need to be addressed. Well, my my thought on on that is, my understanding is we don't have. Um, an architectural drawing, we don't know how many units are gonna be there. And the height and number of residents determines the formula 
that determines parking. Is that correct? Typically, parking requirements are based on the type of uses that are proposed on a development. The exception in our ordinance is when we establish the innovation district and we set a blanket, blanket minimum of one space per 1,000 square feet, regardless of what type of use that was. Correct. As you may recall, staff proposed no minimum parking in that type of district. Uh, that type of district is similar to this one where it suggests a compact urban style of development that's not necessarily oriented around uh, utilizing the vehicle to get to get around. I, I guess my question is, I understand the concern and the question is good. Do we have enough information at this point in time to address formulas previously used for a minimum parking? Obviously maximum parking is desirable, but am, am I not understanding it correctly? As an alternative to what is proposed, the parking requirements that would be applicable in this zoning district could could defer to the existing rows in this table where it lists the individual parking requirements based on the type of use. That's, that's the table that we refer to uh, when we are reviewing site plans to ensure that they have parking that fits within the minimum and maximum. And so as an alternative, uh, that could uh, be a way to regulate parking in this zoning district. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, sir. Question, please. <coughs> So to me, this is getting more and more confusing because we're, we're looking at an area that's not in our town, not in our county, and we're trying to create a, you know, a proposed amendment here. And the uses that you want to put into this or, or propose to be put into this, like skating rink. I mean, if they're going to put a skating rink in, I would think that they'd look for outside people not just the residents of this building to go to a skating rink. And I, I, I don't know how much imagination everybody else has here, but to me, how am I supposed to imagine we have this building, we're gonna put all these different commercial things in, skating rinks, swimming pools, invite all the public to come here, and we have no way of like imagining how much space there is to even say, this is the minimum park and we should have. Because I mean, you you can have more and more and more people come into this area, you know, without knowing how many <coughs> residents, without knowing anything, and without a drawing or somebody's imagination to say, hey, this is what we're thinking of. This what this is our plan. How can we talk about a minimum and maximum parking? Yeah, you're raising good questions. Certainly, there are different schools of thought when it comes to parking. I mean, we've had this conversation before. Um, from a planning staff perspective, uh, minimum parking requirements tend to be overkill. They tend to lead to development patterns that do not utilize land well. They also lead to more impervious surface, more stormwater management controls that need to be uh, accommodated for. And when we talk about having uh, development in an area that maybe considered uh, you know adjacent to an environmentally sensitive area or something or, or a environmentally um, valuable area uh, you know the, the concerns of impervious surface come into play I would say the same uh, logic applies as far as limiting where minimum parking requirements are necessary in a in context sensitive type of design so minimum parking requirements, the minimum amount of parking that we may want to see in a pedestrian oriented area, such as the gateway district, those are gonna be probably not the same as what we may want to see in a suburban type of development context. And so it's staff's opinion that a one size fits all park minimum parking standard is not, uh, not a good uh, policy implementation for utilizing land uh, efficiently. Uh, one more thing. It I mean, we just even thinking about all of this right now. <coughs> are we going to have any testimony, or I mean, we've heard uh, ten people. I think eight of them talked about this area is flooding, which is you know a concern of everybody, and how it's you know it's, it's a negative impact on this area. Of course, we'd want to hear from the developer to say, well, 
I know flooding is a concern, and I'm going to do this much to remediate it. Mm -hmm. But if there's no drawing or anything to show, well, this is how he's doing it, and how much land is going to be lost or increased to perform this. You know, how can we make a decision on this zone that we have? It, it's we're looking at a blank picture. So we're, we're certainly off the topic of parking now. Okay. Um, there were some well, comments I mean, made about uh, about else, flooding right. tonight, and that's uh, you know a, a viable concern here. I, I would say that development is allowed in special flood hazard areas. The town's flood damage prevention ordinance that was referenced earlier in the meeting tonight is a layer that is on top of any additional regulations that may come into play. And so in the town of Leland, as like many other jurisdictions, if the flood damage prevention ordinance is met, then that development can occur. Now the town does have uh, some latitude as far as what that flood damage prevention ordinance says, as far as the design requirements. Uh, the town could also take a position that development shouldn't happen in any flood zone. Currently, that's not the town's position. That would take a policy change and a regulatory change. So there are a variety of regulations that would layer on top of what is being proposed in this amendment tonight to address things like building compliant to the flood damage prevention ordinance, traffic impact analyses, uh, wetlands mitigations, Coastal Area Management Act rules, how you can develop adjacent to um, public waters. Uh, so all those things layer on top of what is being proposed tonight and are in effect currently for any development that happens in the town of Cleveland. Okay, good. I, 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 think, I think we've clear on that point that, that we, we can't reach a point of final destination until we actually have more facts on what will, in fact, be proposed. As I see it right now, what we have here is is the is the bottom line is what is possible, what is proposed, uh, and we don't have the answers to those yet. Am, am I wrong? No, what you're saying is accurate. The purpose of this exercise is to talk about creating a zoning district, and if that zoning district is created, what additional regulations should be written into our code of ordinances that may not already exist. And so things like uh, you know, heightened flood damage prevention codes right. or you know, parking is another example. You know, how do we want, if we were to recommend to council to adopt the creation of the zoning district, what are the supplemental regulations that would, that are important to meet not only the intent of the ordinance, but are reasonable and in the public interest. Okay, good. Any more questions on parking? <coughs> All right, we can move on. I don't intend to read every word on every slide from here on out. No. Uh, I will <laughs> Thank <be> you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've lost my voice by the end of the night, but I hope that you've had an opportunity to read it. I know that not everyone in the room has, so. Uh, I just want to say thank you for wanting to speak over. Yes. Did we not talk about speaking in my, Richard, please speak into your Did we mind. not talk about the height of this in this zone of 300 feet? We have not talked about it yet. Okay, we will? We will. So in this section, we're getting into the actual development standards that would need to be met. So this is the first set here, talking about screening of utility and, and equipment. These are all very standard conditions, essentially, from any other building complex, correct? They are. I would yeah. say that they go a little bit further than uh, more our existing than. regulations in an attempt to require screening for uh, building inside appurtenances that may be deemed obtrusive to and, some. And, and the, yeah, visible uh, camouflage and, and things like that. Hey, sure. Good. Thank you. Question. Please, Joe. Ben. When we look at this, you know, I understood you said developer 
sent some of this to the town of Leland, how much more did the planning department add to this? Sure, good question. So I would say not much in this particular section. We did suggest uh, some changes in the areas that talked about uh, stormwater controls and um, some other features. As we get to them, I'll try to point those out. I don't have a version that shows that red line. Okay, thank you. Move on to site lighting here. This is pretty typical. Uh, site lighting needs to be limited in intensity and direction so as to not cast light onto adjacent properties. Question on lighting? Oh, good. Subsection three here is talking about parking and driveway requirements. A <coughs> is saying that the existing requirements would need to be met. B is saying that surface parking lots visible from public right of way would need to be screened. C is saying that parking needs to be accessed via alleyway, alleyways wherever possible. And that would be instead of directly from a street. Okay. D gets into site design, or, or excuse me, uh, elemental design requirements of any above grade parking structure. So, uh, fancy name for a parking deck would need to be designed in a way that meets this requirement. And E requires that low impact development, <coughs> such as but not limited to what's listed here must be used to manage storm water flow from parking areas. <coughs> so since we know that there's a high water table there and uh, I guess or site constraints allow, that wording was a little bothersome to me. I mean, what are they gonna do for their storm water? I mean, it's a very high water table. There's flooding there already. So where's the stormwater going to go? Stormwater requirements would be another existing set of regulations that would need to be met. The town has a stormwater ordinance that is actually more restrictive than the state's requirement. If this amendment was adopted and property was annexed, particularly talking about where this zoning district could go, the town's stormwater regulations would apply and those regulations would need to be met. Section four talks about multimodal transportation opportunities. This is a section talking about uh, pedestrian and bicycle circulation primarily, setting out standards for sidewalks, internal street grid patterns, and the requirement of a river walk running a minimum of 90% of the property frontage, not shown on this slide, but on the next slide. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. So as at the end of number A, um, sidewalks and crosswalks shall be provided with the new developments as necessary. Who determines as necessary? That would be the role of the town's technical review committee. go to D, E, and F on the next slide. This is still under the same section, multimodal transportation opportunities. to the next section. Okay. Subsection five talks about the requirements for street trees. 
currently the only zoning district in which we require street trees is in the innovation district in the street yard requirements so this is a requirement that is uh, different from other zoning districts in in the town's ordinance No questions? We can move on. Very good. Six talks about trash containment screening. Trash containment areas, dumpster pads, uh, those sorts of things should be located inside a building where possible. If they can't, they should be <coughs> placed on the side of the rear or out of the public right of way, screened with opaque fence, wall, or plant materials. Clear. Thank you. Fences and walls are prohibited. If they are made of open wire fencing, chain link, hurricane fencing, or barbed wire, any other type of fencing may not exceed four feet in height. Eight talks about building design elements. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Me? there's a couple of references in there about new buildings and I mean, to me, all of these are gonna be new buildings. So I was wondering why the word new buildings was used in some places. like for number C. We could strike the word new. If there's some concern that existing buildings would not have to meet this requirement. Now we're in the I, future. I, I see no reason to strike it. Look in the future down the road. Uh, there will be additional, I mean, I, I get the question, understand the question, but I think it defines itself as opposed to an existing, you know, so well, I think I'm, I'm good either way. I think r removing the word new could be advantageous because once a building is uh, constructed and has been there for a while, it's not going to be new, so questionably it may not works fall under this restriction. It's a simple works change. Works either way, that's my point, right. yeah. <coughs> well, if repairs have to be done to a building because it was damaged, it's no longer new, so you would want to maintain the same true. type of... That's true. Noted. Understood. It's a simple mm -hmm. change. <coughs> no questions? Down through D. All right. Nope, we're good. Number nine in the final subsection as written under the supplemental regulation section talks about site resiliency and protection of an environmental resources. Ms. Wells have, would give the opinion that this is where uh, regulations are inserted to meet the intent statement that we looked at earlier. What this is saying is that a living shoreline uh, as defined by NOAA, Army Corps, and SAGE be established along all river frontages, hardened or gray shorelines are prohibited except in areas approved for a ferry or river taxi slip. B discusses additional resiliency features shall be identified with each development proposal and C sets out the opportunity for uh, educational markings to educate the public and visitors about resiliency that may be incorporated into the site design. Questions, comments? 
right? Well, I just think there's still a lot not addressed from the living shoreline standpoint, putting anything in that area. <coughs> um, I think somebody said it earlier well, and something that I had made a note of too, you can engineer things all day long, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And I guess I really worry about hardening that side of the river and what is that gonna do for the hardened side of that is already hardened on the Wilmington side. And what's that gonna do to us? And not knowing the plans for everything, how is the, the, the we know that sunny day flooding happens right now at the battleship. So when we get to the sunny day flooding and it happening at this <coughs> new development, where is all that water gonna go? And are people gonna be trapped? And is that gonna make things worse for the battleship? And is that gonna make wor things worse for downtown Wilmington? So I don't know, I just feel like we might still be missing some things. We haven't had a lot of time to review this yet. And just thinking about the cumulative impacts of what's gonna be happening in that area. Um, I have some other concerns. Of I would just point out in regard to the hardened shoreline stabilization, this section would prohibit that except in areas yeah. approved for a ferry or a river taxi slip. So this section is deliberately saying that uh, you, you can't uh, use hardened shoreline stabilization in, in any area except in, in with those exceptions. So a river walk area isn't going to have a bulkhead or anything no. that the river walk sits on? or As it's written, no, it wouldn't. And I'm also reading, getting a slight dif deformation as I read, so the living shoreline, the coastal reduction, best practices, et cetera, recognized by NOAA and, and, and all the others, shall be established along all river frontages. What we don't have here is the specifics on what those best practices are, but I, what I am taking from this is that those will be determined and followed. Is that what this intent is? So the, the language at the beginning of A talks about uh, whose standards or guidance would need to be followed, and that would be NOAA, right. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and SAGE. Correct. SAGE is a systems approach to geomorphic engineering. I'll mm -hmm. look it up. Okay. Thanks. And it's just a best practice thing. Um, there's some pilot projects that are trying to get going around the country and I asked for information on them and it's slowed down quite a bit. So it's more of a theory than a actual projects you can go look okay. at to see how they've performed. There are a variety of local examples of living shorelines that have been uh, developed uh, primarily with the lead of North Carolina Coastal Federation so there are uh, some local examples of it working in uh, in how coastal shoreline stabiliza stabilization could be done in a way that doesn't include things like riprap or bulkheads. Okay, good. Any others on this item? <coughs> All right, thank you. No more on that. The final area to present to you for discussion is uh, proposed amendments to the section that talks about dimensional standards. This is a table from the ordinance that talks about uh, things such as minimum lot widths, setbacks, <coughs> uh, yard depths. What is being proposed is a minimum lot size for this zoning district of five acres and a maximum structure height of 300 feet. <coughs> the way that we measure building height in the town is uh, from 
the adjacent grade to the highest points of the building. There are some exceptions for things like uh, chimneys and other decorative elements that are on the roof of the structure. That building height measurement is uh, the same measurement that is used by the city of Wilmington and other, most other jurisdictions in the area. I have a question. Yes, sir. The first criteria <coughs> in the design section was that whatever's created here should be compatible with what's going on here right. in the area. Mm -hmm. How is a 300 foot building going to be compatible? Sure, question. good question. In the city of Wilmington, there are uh, height allowances that vary in what they call the central business district. What we're seeing here is a map from their land development code that uh, the colors correspond with the height allowances uh, for different areas along the waterfront there. The area in the rectangle shape on the left of the picture there is the approximate area of applicability for the zoning district. The city's code also talks about, uh, again, the building height calculation and uh, provides that diagram there. So uh, what we see on here is that the city allows for uh, different development heights, essentially kind of based on the location, geographic location, as far as where it is downtown. <coughs> what this height allowance map doesn't show is how the grade changes based on the height allowances there. Nice. So uh, what we see here are two foot contours the wavy lines there, the numbers that we see are the uh, estimated elevations based on those two foot contours. As the lines are closer together, that means the grade increases. And so what we see, and if I'm sure everybody's been to downtown Wilmington, if you're standing on Water Street or on the water's edge and looking <coughs> back towards downtown, it goes uphill. So even though the building height allowance at the river's edge may be less than what excuse me, maybe more than what is allowed more inland, the height of the structure is more or less sort of even out based on the grade and how the building height is calculated. So what's the height of the, is the PPG building, the tallest building? That That's area? correct. The PPD so building is so uh, formerly known as the PPD so building. How could that building be above the river height? Above the river height, I, I'm not sure. I would uh, assume it would be close to 193 feet because it's 193 feet in elevation. <laughs> PPD is 193, yes. Yes. Or what used to be a PPD. So what you're saying is, the amendment that you're taking in my case. The 300 feet is going to sit down lower because the elevation is lower over here on the other side. Well, it's going to be more than what is on the other side of the river, that's for sure. Um, <coughs> how that fits into the context or is that inconsistent with the surrounding community I think is a valid question. There's some subjectivity to that. You know, if a 300 foot building was proposed adjacent to uh, downtown Wilmington, certainly it would, uh, it would be taller than those buildings. It would be taller than the PPD building. Uh, is, is it inconsistent with it being across the river and being separate, physically separated from those buildings does that mean it's consistent or not consistent? That's a fair question. Um, if we just, we heard testimony today, well, testimony, we heard comments today, I'm sorry. <coughs> Comment today from one of the speakers that said that this applicant was willing to reduce the height of building from 300 to 240. Well, why is it now the applicant wants 300 feet if he already stated in a previous uh, hearing that he'd reduce it to 240. That's a good question. I'd like to give the applicant an opportunity to speak on that when we invite uh, their team up to speak, which we should. Uh, in my conversations about that change, it's my understanding that that increase in height would accommodate what they're referring to as a sacri sacrificial ground floor. And so in their consideration of uh, designing a site that takes into consideration resiliency elements, uh, things like storm inundation or the potential for sea level rise. That additional height allows them to create a ground floor that um, does just what it says it does. It could become sacrificial. And so there's not a loss of, uh, of property or a um, potential for uh, pu a public safety issue with 
anything that's habitable being in an area that is has the potential for inundation. So that extra height that they're proposing in this amendment here in the town of 300 versus the 240, whatever it was, that was uh, concluded at the county is to accommodate that. <laughs> it's also my understanding that in the concession with New Hanover County about reducing their uh, height allowance from the originally proposed 291 down to the 240, whatever it was, uh, there was also a, an agreement or discussion about the change in how that building height would be measured. And it's my understanding that instead of measuring it in the typical way that uh, is measured from the adjacent grade to the top of the building, or the highest point of the building, that measurement would actually start at the regulatory flood elevation, which is four, uh, 12, 11 feet in this area. So the base flood elevation is nine feet for a 100 year storm. <coughs> New Hanover counties and the town of Leland's freeboard requirement, which is the extra height that you have to put on top of the regulatory flood elevation or on top of the base flood elevation, excuse me, is two feet. And so the regulatory flood elevation, both for New Hanover County and the town of Leland would be uh, two feet on top of the nine feet, which is 11 feet. So. In that concession to go down to 241, they also upped where that measurement is taken from. So they went down in height, but up to where it was measured from. Being pleased, that <clears throat> my understanding the 300 feet is is a number that was has been initially requested by the developer, and that there is no restriction that that be approved by by the, by the planning board, town council. Or, and I would assume it would also be reviewed by the TRC. That is correct. So that's strictly a number that they're asking for, not one that we could not negotiate. Well, I mean, it's one that we can negotiate to whatever seems more uh, appropriate for, for our use. So it, whatever number is adopted, assuming there is something not in the instance that something is adopted, whatever that height number is, is what they're allowed to do. And so if they propose if it's written into the code to say 300 and they propose 300, there's no negotiation process in that. There's no opportunity for the staff or the planning board or the town council to say, ah, we, don't, we don't think that that 300 is good here on this property. They would be allowed to do what the code says. Mr. Sandy? Yes. Um, I guess an overall concern I have with this zoning district is we're given one developer we're letting we're considering giving one developer his own zoning district and we're setting a precedent for other developers to come up with their own zoning district with putting this 300 foot height in there the the highest we have right now is 55 feet so other developers are going to come in and say well you gave this guy 300 feet so you need to give us 300 feet and we need to think about if that's really where we want to go Because this is setting a precedent. I feel like I'm being looked at for a response. A, a couple <laughs> comments I would I would make on that is that, uh, as you all know, we just adopted a, a, a land use plan. Uh, our next big step in implementation of that plan is to do an overhaul of our code of ordinances. So in that, uh, staff certainly intends to come before you and propose additional zoning districts that we don't have now. The reasoning for that is to create additional tools in the town's regulatory toolbox to accommodate growth patterns that are desired in the 2045 plan. Uh, the town has been subject to uh, suburban sprawl to a degree. Uh, we have seen a fair amount of development that utilizes the options that are available. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But what we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox for are compact uh, urban style developments that uh, achieve a better efficient use of land. So with any text amendment application from someone in the public, we do respond to that. Uh, any person could potentially apply for a zoning district moving forward. We don't, uh, we can't necessarily prevent that. Um, this zoning district proposal is specific to a particular area and I think that it's hard to separate the concept of the project that's been discussed in the media and how that relates to the zoning district. 
Um, whether it's this zoning district or other changes to the ordinance, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have uh, additional regulatory options for different styles of development than we currently have. If there's no more questions or comments that you would like to hear from me, I would uh, suggest that we give the applicant an opportunity to come speak and maybe respond to some of the questions that have come up so far that I haven't been able to answer, can if that's I, okay. Can I ask one more question? Yes, please. I don't believe there's currently water and sewer over there. I'm sorry? I don't believe there's currently water and sewer over there. It's my understanding that a recent project from the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority does provide the potential for water and sewer service delivery to this area. So there is a project or is a potential project? The project has been completed to my understanding. The sewer project that, uh, that I'm referencing is the uh, Flemington area project that CFP way pursued running sewer through the Flemington area, which had a dual, dual benefit of, of uh, providing utilities, uh, but the potential for utility service in the 421 corridor. And I have another question from a planning standpoint. Um, this week, I don't remember this being talked about at all as being an area to grow in in our 2045 plan. And I look back at the 2045 plan and some of the biggest challenges that the our citizens brought up was traffic congestion and loss of degradation of natural resources and sprawling development and flooding and environmental impacts and providing town services economically. And just my initial take is those were all concerns of, of our citizens and expanding over on the other side of the river is kind of going <laughs> against all of those things that we identified in the 2045 plan. So um, I guess I didn't see it as a key growth area for the town. And I don't know, Jason, if you have any comment from your working on the plan at all. Or yeah, thank you. Um, I was going to wait until after we heard from the applicant, but I'll go ahead and throw out some comments now. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work on the 2045 plan as a representative from the planning board. Uh, and you are correct, This we did not identify um, anything like this proposed change in the 2045 plan. Um, you've highlighted some of the concerns that folks brought up in the 2045 plan. My concerns on this project are water infrastructure, public safety. We have, a, we have to balance what's best for uh, the town versus uh, concerns from our fellow neighbors, you know, we kind of have to look around the corner. Not only were our neighbors next door not in favor of this, uh, but I feel like before this board has to make a recommendation to council um, that we need, it's, and I think it's clear from the discussion this evening that we need, a, we need more time to uh, dive into this and really understand exactly what's being asked the impacts to the current town and the impacts of the future town. Uh, but I appreciate the fact that everybody has come out and voiced their concern. That's what makes this such a great town and, and forum. Uh, and also to the staff, <coughs> thank you for uh, the work that you have done on this. It's got to be uh, an interesting feeling to know you're going to walk into a room full of opposition on something you're presenting so uh, I recognize that and, and I appreciate that um, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Gabriel I did just want to respond to something because it's not, not the first time I heard it tonight uh, I wanted to clarify where New Hanover County is I I in their position on this uh, the planning staff had made a recommendation uh, to the planning board for approval the planning board voted to pass a motion to recommend denial the item went back, went to the Board of Commissioners at which planning staff made a recommendation for approval. So the commissioners, the elected body and the decision makers there have not made a decision as 
whether they're in support or not in support of this, uh, a, a, some version of this amendment. And, and essentially it's the same process that we have from your chart before. Any recommendation we make to approve or disapprove uh, or to continue can be reviewed and the town council is not obligated to, to accept or are facing. So I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to ask for a final uh, comment or question from each of the board members, if necessary, before I call for a motion. Well, I thought we were going to hear from the. Well, it is the applicant. The, the uh, applicant is not a speaker tonight, is he? I think that I think with a, a proposal like this, it's customary to let the applicant at least respond to some of the questions that have come oh, up tonight. I, I didn't know that they were present. They are. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, it's I, early. If, if, early. If you are ready, we can invite uh, Aaron Hutchins from Summit Design and Engineering or his Certainly. designee to. Certainly. Uh, come respond to some of the questions that I wasn't able to answer. Mr. Chairman, given that we've been at this for two hours and uncertainty on how long the <laughs> presentation and discussion is going to take, uh, may we take a five to ten minute recess? You can do that. Call a five minute recess.
I'd call the meeting back into session, please. And can everybody get in their, their uh, chairs as you wish? Mr. Chairman, uh, before we hear from the applicant's team, I did want to clarify, I may have misspoken, I just, I, I didn't mean to, but w regarding the New Hanover County uh, positions that I talked about a little bit earlier, so the planning staff has consistently recommended approval of this. The planning board recommended denial. So if I didn't say that earlier, that's what I meant to say, and okay. that's what has happened. Good clarity. And, um, it was not previously on the agenda, but we certainly want to welcome the applicant to, to respond. Uh, can you please give us your name, position, and, and then you have the floor. Absolutely, thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Patrick Cummings, and I'm with Summit Design and Engineering Services. And, and Patrick, would you yeah, put the mic up at you? I'll start Here over. Go. Good evening, my name is Patrick Cummings, and I'm with Summit Design and Engineering Services, and we are the applicant for this uh, text amendment. Uh, first of all, tonight I'd, I'd just briefly like to thank staff for their work uh, on this project so far. They've been wonderful to work with and, and we're also grateful for the consideration the planning board has tonight for our request. I'm truly here to answer questions. We do not have a formal or long-winded presentation prepared or planned, but I would like to make a few remarks uh, specific to um, the request this evening. Um, this pro this uh, text amendment request uh, is not specific to a singular project or a singular parcel, but more a district uh, of parcels uh, consistent along the riverfront. Um, and uh, the, the conception or the idea about a project uh, in this area or within this district uh, will be guided by this text amendment. And so the process by which uh, any project would follow uh, behind this text amendment would be subject to, uh, as Ben mentioned, the full complement of, of permitting menu here within the state of North Carolina related to floodplain, related to environment, related to planning and zoning requirements. Uh, and I think that's you know a continuous uh, theme throughout any project uh, that would be covered by the river Riverfront Urban Mixed Use District. So um, this text amendment covers uh, the geography outlined in, in Ben's presentation. And I'm, I'm here to answer questions or any clarifications in the development of this text amendment action. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, Board Brickness, please go ahead, Warren. I guess I guess the biggest question that I have is uh, we heard a lot today about flooding in that area, and I don't know if you're able to answer this or not. But how would the flooding be remediated in that area to, you know, supply what you want to, you know, to to actually hold, you know, buildings and make it operable in that area without causing any problems to the surrounding area? As I mentioned before, uh, any project associated with uh, this zoning district would be subject to all applicable regulatory uh, agencies uh, and permitting consistent with the location of the site. Um, we've got state agency review from floodplain management, Department of Transportation. Uh, we've got state agency review from uh, a host of um, Department of Environmental Health, Division of Water Quality, Division of Land Resources, and I'm only laboring on to illustrate the fact that the design of any projects associated with this district would be subject to the most current floodplain management requirements that the state of North Carolina or the U.S. Army Corps requires of development. So how would you go about that? I mean, you're going to ask them to give you advice before you even think of a project, or are you going to have a, do you have a project in mind for them to, to look at? How, how does that work? Well, I think the, in relation to this request through New Hanover County and through now the town of Leland, there's been a lot of information shared across the media, social media, but the reality is the final design of a project consistent with this district or in this district would be subject to design requirements that would not allow for development within the floodplain that would have adverse impacts to the floodplain. And that is to say, any development, this or this applicant, us or others, would be subject to the most current and resilient standards that North Carolina and the Army Corps require. So to give a flavor of solutions is a little bit difficult. And I heard you earlier ask about, it's hard to conceive what we would do without a picture in front or without a, a plan or a drawing. We, we understand your sentiment there, and this zoning district, this text amendment, simply provides 
firmer guidance on what that drawing might look like going forward. But it's not meant to regulate floodplain management or flooding. North Carolina, the U.S. Army Corps have pretty specific standards as it relates to how any parcel or any project in this district would be able to do with the floodplain. Other questions? Yes, Harrison. Um, sir, thank you very much for being here. I see a ring on your finger. You're a married man. <laughs> if, follow me here. If, if your wife came home and said, hey, I want to make a significant life change, there's significant tertiary impacts to multiple facets of your life, and I want you to make an, a decision within a week. Would you feel comfortable with that? I, I'm not sure I can answer that question as it relates to this exercise. I'm here as an applicant for sure. a, a text you, amendment. You have asked the town to, to devote a whole and make a whole new zoning district, and they've asked the planning board uh, within a matter of a few days to absorb all of that information and make a decision. The basis on my question is, if you were in our seat, would you feel comfortable, given the lack of information and the significant impacts to the town, would you feel comfortable making a recommendation one way or the other? I can appreciate your concern. Uh, the process by which we applied for this text amendment, I believe what's consistent with the first slide that Ben Andrea showed this evening, the process that we are required to follow to submit for a text amendment, the timing of which I don't know that we as the applicant have control of, but I know that we're able to submit and follow that process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, then, then I would offer to the town and the town staff, uh, maybe you put us in a bit of a predicament by asking us to make a decision uh, given the, the depth and breadth of this. Mr. Gaber, I hear you loud and clear. I just want to point out that we added this item as a discussion item with the anticipation of some robust conversation. So I don't think it's fair to say that the planning staff or the applicant asked you all to take a make a decision tonight. I think you have the mm -hmm. option to make a decision, but I don't think that's what's being asked mm -hmm. of you. Correct. I, I, I've got to tell you you had a comment or question. Well, I think I'll hear a little bit more from the, I, I guess the question I'm raising is there another development that companies have done similar to this project? Can you repeat your question, please? Is there another project that Summit have uh, completed similar to this project that you want to put on the river? In relation to the text amendment work or for I mean, future a development a work? Similar project? Uh, uh, yeah. Not the text amendment, just a project similar to this. Well, you know, the history of the company, that's why I was asking. You're asking if Summit has done a riverfront right, river project. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure how to define applicability of a riverfront project. Summit has done projects consistent with the density and okay. complexity of projects like this, but to say we've done a project in this area, there's not a district there to do that work. So okay, all right. No, that's sir. Okay. So you, you've created this text amendment proposal based on a specific project that somebody wants to develop on that piece of property without telling us what the property fee is. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how to do that. I don't know how to absorb that. Any other comments or questions? Well, if, if not, I, as the chair, I'm going to move that. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm sorry. I have one statement. You know, sitting here, I, I, I went and looked at the property. I was down there six months ago looking at the property from a historic perspective. We're doing some research. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of comments about the flooding. I heard a lot, of, you know, uh, the building going to be too tall, uh, this, that. This I saw to start with. It's a junk pile. Nobody, nobody's saying we want to hold on to the property to make it a nice park. Nobody. Developer come. So I looked around Leela. Where could we put another project in Leela? Can you ask the question on, can you got question the 2045 plan? We do have property on the Brunswick River. 
Farm developers want to come and put that type of project on the Brumsett River. Are we so concerned about the developer of it? Are we concerned about, you know, the that we don't want nothing there? Those are questions that run through my mind. Sitting here tonight, the property is a junk pile. Nobody's doing anything about it. Not the Sierra Club, uh, you know, the water management, this preservation group. If it's a brownfield, nobody's trying to get money to clean it up. Nobody. And that, that, that's what really bothers me. If the concern about that, why are we not fighting to clean it up? Sorry. Well, we talk about contamination. It's a brownfield. It's a junk pile. It's heavy equipment over there. It's tired. All that's going in the river as we sit here tonight. Mm -hmm. Why are they talking about cleaning it up? So I think we need to put all that in the package, you know, to look at versus saying, well, we don't want that. Well, we shouldn't want the jump pop. Good point. All I have to say. Good point. At, at this time, it's at this time it's it's clear to me, <coughs> and I think to the other members of the board, uh, that clearly there's a lot of good lot of good questions that have been asked. There are many there are many questions to be answered. And at this point in time, I feel, with the amount of time we've had to study this, that this board is not prepared to, to make an approval or a denial. And therefore, I will move to continue this item to the March 22nd, 2022 Planning Board meeting. I'll second it. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. The Thank you for your time. Been continued. Thank you. My thanks to, to the attendees as well. Uh, probably one of the best behaved crowds I've been around in this business for a while. <laughs> so we thank, we, we thank you, okay? Uh, okay, onward with the meeting then. We are now at the Holding your business. business, I believe. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. In the, uh, as the meeting has been going on tonight, we were made aware that the uh, applicant for item eight uh, was, in, was in attendance but was not uh, given the opportunity to speak about that item, as you may recall. Uh, this was the first action item that you all talked about. You all uh, did not pass any motion to approve or not approve this subdivision plat. Uh, I think it's prudent to let, give the applicant an opportunity to speak in regards to the connection that was in question uh, earlier in the meeting. I, I would agree, and since the meeting is still in session, that can be resurfaced, uh, and we can hear from that applicant and then Render another decision if we decide to. Make a motion, please. I'll make the motion to re, re uh, bring that app, uh, application number memo was it twenty two zero zero five zero. Correct. Bring it back up to for continue it. Motion made. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. And once again, I'll have to ask: Is there anybody with conflict of interest on their? There was none prior or association? If not, good. Uh, then, Mr. Andre, the floor is yours, sir. I just want to make sure I understood the motion correctly. The motion was to reconsider, to that talk, discuss this item again tonight. Now, now, now yeah, considered okay. an old business and can be reconsidered. Very yes. good. <coughs> Earlier in the meeting, you all uh, and Mr. Watts led a good conversation about the connection requirements and it seems that the planning board was not 
uh, willing to approve this project based on the omission of the second required connection uh, despite the environmental constraints. Uh, what I would recommend to the board is to uh, approve this project with the condition that the, that the second required connection be shown. We could have the applicant speak on this. Uh, if, if that's okay with the uh, yes, chair and the board, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, absolutely we can. <coughs> we meet again. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize yeah. for um, not speaking up or earlier. I didn't think it was my place at the time, but I do appreciate you um, considering my um, my plea. Quite all right. Properly done. Ben, do you have a a, a pointer by chance or a, a laser? Uh, I do. I can point for you if you tell me where to point. Or oh, here you go. Could could I could I ask a, for a point of brevity? If, yes, if you could come over here and speak from there, is that acceptable? Here, does he have to be at the mic still? We need the mic. Okay, I'm sorry. I just thought it'd be easier. You can be pointing, and we can be looking. But okay, that'll work. So my understanding of the concerns was threefold. It was uh, connectivity to the north. It was from um, uh, Mr. Bryant some potential flooding, and then thirdly from Mr. Bryant some um, uh, traffic uh, issues. Uh, so first of all, the connection to the north, which I believe we're we're talking about right there. We're showing a connection here that. Um, I believe you're asking for connection over this um, this um, wetland area. So my response would be is we're happy to provide that, but it is not a practical thing to do. There's very, and if you had a Google map of this land, you would see that there's very, very little upland here that that road would serve. Pine Cliff Road runs right here that would is already serving that land that is owned by that particular owner, so the, the cost-benefit analysis for anyone to build that bridge across a significant creek right there, in my opinion, is just not practical. However, if, if is your wish, we will show this, this stub-out road you know, to the property line there, okay? Secondly, um, I think there was some questions about um, about flooding, and we could probably go back a couple of maps, but it's not necessary. This is really high land. This land right here, uh, Mr. Bryant, is probably 15 feet above the uh, the wetlands right here. Uh, hence, the, the 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 my comment that it really doesn't make practical sense to build a, a road you know, through that 15 foot you know um, uh, elevation. Uh, right there, but this is really high dry land, and if you look at it as a whole, it stands up four or five feet above this here, and probably ten feet above this uh, the, this area here. And then, lastly, we talked about uh, the dispersion of traffic. So we are planning a we we have a connection with Pine Cliff Road, we have a connection with Old Town Creek Road, and we have purchased this piece of land. Let's see. We have purchased this piece of land here that we're in the midst of um, 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 applying for annexation within the town that will give us <coughs> access to Town Creek Road. So of all the developments that I've been in, this actually disperses the traffic more than any others. One here, uh, one here, and although it's not on the map, one here on uh, Old Town Creek Road. So I believe, it's just my opinion, that, that your concerns, um, I just didn't do a good job of explaining it um, um, in the, uh, I guess, the original presentation. To my, to my right, when you come over, when you come over this road here that comes all the way through, right and then, no, it's in the circle. It's in, come on over. Now, when you come in, you come around, loop around, and pass up above the wetland. Now, we go up by street four. You see street four? Mm -hmm. Right. 
There was something about that particular outlet. Yeah, okay. Explain that. So, so Joe, I understand your question. Again, <coughs> if you had a, 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 a aerial picture, a Google map of this area right there, there is a, a dwelling unit here, a dwelling unit here, and a dwelling unit there mm -hmm. that is serviced by Pine Cliff Road. Right. There is very, very little upland sort of right there that this potential road would service. Um, my contention would be is that the owner of this land right here, Mr. Carlisle, would have access off Pine Cliff Road, and that would give him all the access that he needs, then it doesn't make sense to to uh, extend this road to a parcel that is outside of the town of Leland um, for that benefit. However, as I said, we would be happy to, sh to provide that if that is a condition of your approval. Mr. Arp, I, I'm gonna, over here across from me, I'm gonna switch to the aerial. You mentioned it a few times, yeah. it might be helpful for what you're trying to articulate here. Okay, is that one yeah. good? So, um, Ben, you, ha you can't drag that, but, uh, but maybe can you go to a GIS, uh, a GIS? Um, it, it okay, might sorry. be technical, technologically <laughs> not, <laughs> not prudent right yeah, now. Okay, so Joe, t um, the land you're talking about is up here, so it's off of this map uh, that shows the upland um, that I'm referring to. And, and I was under the impression all the time that that road I was talking about would go to Pine Cliff. That was a big discussion some time ago. Yeah, with <coughs> on another. That is a separate yeah. road. That okay. is a separate road that was approved at a prior, um, a prior meeting. Okay. I guess six months ago. So we do have a connection with Pine Cliff, uh, and then I believe Pine Cliff is going to be improved as a result of that uh, for um, for our traffic to go out. All right. But I, it's my strong feeling that we meet the ordinance. Um, we have history. Okay, so um, we have history that, that I've built maybe 4,000 lots in the town of Leland and we haven't had the first flooding incident where I-95 was closed, 17 washed in two, 133 was closed, 87 was closed, 74, 76 was closed, and not the first lot that I've ever built in, um, in the town of Leland ever flooded. So I'm proud of that fact. And the same care, the same design, the same engineer, uh, the same developer is, uh, is doing this. and. I assure you we'll stick with that. And, and that's my concern because there was some other road like Old Fed. Right. You know, Old Fed was in two sections. Right. Like they've been washed out. Right. Now they're doing some dynamic work down there by the school. They're moving the water over right. and a catch box and that is gonna be great. But my concern that, you know, if, if we don't fix that shoulder they're going to wash out again. Right. Well, so my, my history uh, and our engineer has, has been with me from my early days of developing. We do not pinch cost on storm drain, and we don't pinch cost on uh, road elevation. And as a result, and you've seen my work, and you've, you've, you've all seen my work, we do not have flooding issues. Okay. So I would respectfully ask if you could reconsider your... Uh, your um, your motion tonight. Comments, questions. Mr. Chairman, my concern was addressed uh, given the information that was provided by the applicant that they have purchased an additional piece of land and there will be an ingress egress point. Yeah, that's right. uh, I feel much more comfortable. Uh, that's why. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I do as well. We all. We all uh, I, I believe you. I believe you have a, have addressed our concern. Uh, we 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 know you. We trust you, but proof is better than the pudding. Okay, <laughs> and that was our concern with the ingress and egress, and uh, it's our responsibility to make decisions based on what is, not always on what we would like or what we hear. So, with that, um, no more questions. Discussion. Any more comments from the staff, uh, Mr. Andrea? No, no, nope. thank you. In that, I will entertain. Yep. I'll make the motion, yep. make the motion to approve it based on what I read before. <laughs> you got to read it again? Yeah, just do it for sure. Uh, yeah, that's that's Why good enough for this, these types of motions. Can we, can motion to approve, sure. Yeah, okay, as good. presented. Yeah. Okay, yeah. a motion has been made to, to approve. Second. second. And there's a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.
Oh, the same sign? Okay. We, it's a motion is approved. Right, Thank you. Uh, staff doesn't have any more old or new business. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip on the report updates tonight, unless you all have any questions for me. Do you have anything new? Do you have anything new for us? Come on. Come on, give us something. Uh, every day is a new a new journey in the town of Leland, that's for sure. Yeehaw. So uh, th thank you all for your, your patience and your time tonight. Uh, we do appreciate it. you do a, a hard and difficult job up there, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. The next meeting will be March 22, uh, as we postponed to that on the remix, so they'll to be prepared again, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll have time to do our homework. Uh, with with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. Okay. Move in second adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 We adjourn.